So I thought it would be fun today to listen to some weird and wonderful instruments that have been used in classical music. So I've chosen a few instruments uh, that you already know but may not realize it that are used in well-known music as well as some more bizarre instruments. And I found music by several famous composers and some that were also new to me, which just goes to show, of course, that one never stops learning. So starting with something really bizarre, I want you to have a closer look at this picture of the Zoffany family, the, sorry, the Sharp family by the artist Zoffany. And focus, can you see my pointer? Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer. This chap yes, in the bottom yes, can, yes, left yes. hand corner. Okay, so I go down to the next slide, which gives you this painting again, and then a, um, a detail, a close up of that detail. And that chap with the black hat and the brown coat is actually holding a serpent shaped instrument and it is called the serpent. And here we see a modern chap playing exactly that thing. Now it is a brass wind instrument descended from the cornet and a distant ancestor of the tuba. So it's got a mouthpiece, as you can see a cup shaped mouthpiece like a brass instrument but side holes like a bassoon or any other woodwind instrument. And in spite of its being made from wood, covered with that leather covering and having finger holes and not valves, it is classified as a brass instrument, probably because of the brass instrument like mouthpiece, which is the origin of how the sound is produced. So it is um, claimed to have been invented by one Canon Edme Guillaume in 1590 in France and was first used to strengthen the sound of choirs in plain chant. Plain chant, of course, is unaccompanied singing, uh, sacred music in the churches and cathedrals. Others claim that the serpent was invented in Italy also during the 16th century. Then around the middle of the 18th century, it began to appear in military bands and even orchestras. And when Handel moved from Germany to England and first heard it, apparently he said, what the devil is that? Um, composers such as Mendelssohn, Beethoven, Rossini, Verdi, Bellini, and the Frenchman Berlioz used the serpent. And this was not always because they liked the way it sounded in the orchestra, but because they had no alternative. Sometimes it was a case of use the instruments at hand. The Offie Clyde was preferred and actually used in many operas, such as Wagner's Rienzi and Verdi's Sicilian Vespers, I Vespri Siciliani. Mozart used two serpentini in his opera, Ascanio in Alba, but it was replaced by the tuba in the 19th century. After that, this instrument dropped out of favor. But the French classical period composer, Michel Corrette, composed a lovely little sonata for the instrument. And that is what we're going to hear now. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now that chat was accompanied by a harpsichord, a theorbo, which is an old fashioned sort of lute, a plucked stringed instrument, and a viol da gamba, um, which is the ancestor of the cello. Now I'm sure you will recognize this perennial ballet favorite by Tchaikovsky. It starts very softly, don't be alarmed, it's there. Now, the Celesta, which sounds like a, a glockenspiel, is actually uh, a rather like a small upright piano. And it's played with two hands, just like a piano. It also has a damper pedal for the same purpose as um, a piano damper pedal that takes the dampers away from the strings, allowing them to continue to resonate. But inside, the hammers strike little metal bars and not strings, giving it that lovely, delicate bell-like timbre. Because this is a striking action, it classifies as a percussion instrument. So the Celesta was invented by the Parisian inventor and organ builder, Auguste Mustel, in 1886. And a mad rush ensued for composers to be the first to use it in their orchestral music. Another Frenchman, Ernest Chausson, made it first, using it in the incidental music for a version of Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, in 1888. Tchaikovsky was next with his Sugar Plum Fairy and the Nutcracker Ballet. And so beautifully did he capture the wintry, Christmassy magic that it's almost as if the Celesta was invented to show off this twirling fairy. So the sound is so delicate that the orchestral accompaniment when it's playing has to be very light 
or it would be completely drowned out. The Hungarian composer Bela Bartok loved its sound so much that he composed his famous music for strings, percussion, and celesta in 1936, a piece which I loved pouring over and um, analyzing as a music student. So that's your homework. Try and listen to that music. Now, the next one we have are the mechanical clocks. And Haydn, the classical period, 18th century composer, um, wrote over 30 pieces for mechanical clocks for his aristocratic patrons, the Esterhazy princes, uh, residing in their magnificent estate at Esterhaza in what is today Hungary. And I've just finished writing the second lecture. Ladies, please all mute yourselves. I've just finished writing the second lecture for summer school next year about composers' musical fingerprints, how to recognize the famous composers by means of their own unique musical characteristics. And I was doing Haydn and Mozart this past month. And um, you'll learn more about Haydn and his actual compositional techniques in that course. Just a little plug for the summer school at the University of Cape Town next year, which I'm hoping will be live, but also online. And talking all about the patronage system and how Haydn spent most of his adult life there at Esterhaza under the patronage of Prince Paul Anton and then Prince Nicholas Esterhazy. So Haydn's friend, Josef Niemitz, a multi-talented monk and librarian, was the chaplain at the Esterhazy family chateau, and he had developed clocks which could play music. This chap could play several musical instruments, and he was the inventor of quite a few musical curiosities. Four of his clocks still survive, and he also came up with a musical spinning wheel and a musical chair, which would play a tune when you sat on it. So Haydn's miniatures can just as easily be played on the organ, closely resembling the sound of this tooting clock. And one of the pieces that he had written for Prince Nicholas II of Esterhazy found its way into his Symphony Number no. 101, affectionately known as the Clock Symphony. So that's more homework. Listen to Haydn's Symphony Number no. 101, the Clock, to hear the tick tock accompaniment in the second movement. He also wrote music for clocks made by one Charles Clay one of which is now in the Handel House Museum in London and another at Windsor Castle. So clocks struck every quarter of an hour and he asked Handel to provide the music for several of them. So the sound was provided by chimes or pump organs and today they're played on a regular organ. But these clocks feature excerpts from Handel's operas, especially the arias, and various keyboard pieces and was one way in those days before CDs and radio and YouTube to promote the circulation of his music. Anyway, here is Haydn's piece for a uh, mechanical clock.
all these pieces are available on YouTube, so you can listen to them again. And if any of you would like my notes from this informal presentation, um, I give my email address at the end. You can drop me a line and I'm happy to send them to you. So um, what I wanted to do before we continue with these unusual instruments is to draw your attention to some fantastic museums of musical instruments that I have encountered on my travels. And especially in the last 11 years that we've been in Stockholm. So the first one I went to with, with my um, elder daughter was back in 2000. And this is the Cité de la Musique, or Philharmonie de, in Parc Villette. It's outside the city center of Paris in the 19th arrondissement. And it actually, as I recall, took about an hour on the metro to get there. But it is absolutely worthwhile. And you can get, look, that was a long time ago, um, 2000, uh, the year 2000, what's that? I mean, that's 21 years ago. What we had, I seem to recall, were audio guides. And as you walked past certain instruments, um, the sound of some of those uh, instruments would come through on your audio guide. And then there was a blurb in English. So, and this was the same with most of these museums. So you can get um, commentaries in your own languages. That was a fantastic museum. Then in uh, London at the Victoria and Albert, there's a wonderful collection of musical instruments. At Oxford, in the, at the university, there's the Ashmolean Museum, which has some beautiful instruments, including a Stradivarius, the so-called Messiah, which has a, a wonderful story, but I don't have time to tell you that now. Um, this museum is a chateau, a house called Hatchlands. It's near Guildford in England. And I went with my Italian friend who used to be in the IWC before they moved to England, IWC Stockholm. There you can just see Renata Spacapietra crossing the lawn there because I caught the train to Guildford where she and her husband were transferred. He works for Ericsson's. And... Um, uh, she gave me lunch, and then we drove in her car to this beautiful, beautiful chateau, a Georgian villa. And there are predominantly um, keyboard instruments on display there. There's, there. There are people living there who take care of this fabulous collection, which includes Marie Antoinette's harpsichord and one of Bach's famous sons, Johann Christian Bach, uh, his piano is there, a Broadwood, an English piano. Then in Brussels, I had been doing a fabulous tour with Martin Randall Travel on Flemish painting. And we ended up in, the last stop was Brussels, and there was this fantastic museum of musical instruments there. In Copenhagen, um, when we first arrived in Stockholm about a month later in the summer, that was August 2010, we took the train, one of those fabulous speed trains that goes zooming through the countryside and turn on curved corners through the lakes and forests down to Copenhagen. And while my husband went to a geology museum, I went to this one, the Danish Music Museum, which also has lots of fascinating instruments from all over the world. Um, and then in Dubai, of all places, my daughter, uh, younger daughter worked there for 18 months. Uh, she's recently returned to Johannesburg. And I went and stayed with her for five days in December 2019, before the whole pandemic thing. And I took myself down to the historical area. And there is the, the Dubai Museum. Dubai originally began as a small settlement for pearl diving. But look at this fascinating instrument, if you could call it that, uh, on the left-hand slide. It is a skirt with goat's hooves. Just above it is a photo of a man wearing one. And he sort of shimmies his waist um, and makes the goat's hooves rattle. Uh, so that was absolutely fascinating. 
And then this stringed instrument, this sort of lyre with a round resonating chamber, and then some pipes. So those were very interesting Middle Eastern instruments. And then I did another, another lovely tour of um, the art of Holland. And for that tour, we were based in a hotel in Utrecht, wonderful old university city in the Netherlands. And one day, quite by chance, I stumbled on this museum spiel clock, um, a, a museum of mechanical instruments, ones like a, a hurdy-gurdy wound up with a wheel before the age of electricity. And it's called the happiest museum in the Netherlands, I would call it the happiest museum in the world with the weirdest, weirdest instruments. And it was just such a wonderful find. It is housed in an old church, as you can see in the top left-hand slide. Um, and then when my husband and I did a wonderful cruise with Hurti Gruten up the west coast of Norway, we stopped in Trondheim where we saw this wonderful um, medieval Gothic cathedral, Nidaros Cathedral, which is one of the stopping points for the Scandics on the Camino towards Camino de Santiago and the Shrine of St. James in Santiago in uh, North Western Spain, and then the Ringve Museum of Musical Instruments. And I wished I could have found a picture of a piano with eight keyboards. It was quite phenomenal, but I didn't take a photo. Perhaps we weren't allowed to. I can't remember. And um, these are the, the pictures that I found. If you happen to come up to Scandinavia, please visit me in uh, Stockholm, have a cup of coffee, and go down or I should say travel west to Oslo and then up the coast to Trondheim. Um, yes, now we're on to our next unusual instrument, and that is the lira organizzata. Haydn seemed to have been attracted to peculiar instruments, or rather his patrons did, making requests for music to be composed for sometimes weird and anachronistic instruments that they were learning to play. One such was this lira organizzata, or organ lyre. You won't find many of these around today. They're, they are a mere curiosity. But it's similar to a hurdy-gurdy, which is played with a bow, like a violin, and the sound is produced by means of a wooden wheel powering a set of bellows for a mini organ inside the body of the instrument. Haydn composed five concertos from 1786 for the instrument, as well as eight nocturnos or nocturnes. The King of Naples, Ferdinand IV, had this weird hybrid part string, part organ created so that he could be different from everybody else and commissioned the well-known composer to write these concertos for him to play. There were other lira organizzata in circulation at the time, but the instrument was pretty much confined to Italy and became virtually extinct. One remains in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Well, Haydn's music is witty and bright, embracing the instrument's quirky operations. These concertos lived on, rearranged by Haydn for the more traditional oboe and flute, thereby, thereby preserving the reedy tone of the lira organizzata and uh, the wind and strings sound for his nocturnes. So let's listen to this now.
Can't go wrong with Haydn. He always composes utterly delightful music. So the next instrument that we're going to listen to is the baritone. So staying with Haydn, between 1765 and 1775, while he was employed at Esterhaza, Prince Nicholas took a shine to the baritone and was determined to master it. The result was a staggering 126 trios for viola, cello, and baritone for the prince to play. So this instrument is a bowed instrument in the viol family. That would be the predecessors of the modern violin family, which consists of the violin, the viola, the cello, and the double bass. And it's about the same size as a cello. It was used regularly in Europe up until the end of the 18th century. It probably fell out of favor because it is very difficult to play. It's got seven and sometimes six strings made of gut, plus from nine to 24 sympathetic wire strings, usually about 12. So the gut strings are bowed while the wire strings are plucked by the thumb of the performer in order to create a contrasting tonal quality. So the baritone displays the characteristics of both the viol de gamba, an early Renaissance instrument, shaped like a double bass and played with a bow, and a bandora, a sort of guitar instrument that was plucked, vaguely resembling a modern uh, many stringed mandolin. So this instrument must have taken some considerable skill to play well, and by all accounts, the prince was quite good at it. This instrument didn't last long after Haydn left the scene, but now this rather unwieldy instrument has been brought back to life by early music enthusiasts and specialists. And Haydn's compositions can now be heard in their original form. So let's listen to that. <laughs> Thank you. 
another interesting thing to remember in this whole scenario of wants to go on to the next section. Let's stop it there. Um, an interesting factor to remember about Haydn's whole way of life was that he still was very much a part of the patronage system, a system that had endured for centuries as part of the feudal system in Europe. And it was up to uh, talented musicians and composers and singers to find themselves a job at court, one of the courts in Europe, because then they were assured of a steady income, of board and lodging, and a secure position for most of their lives. Haydn was at Esterhaza for most of his adult life. He barely traveled and only started going to London towards the end of his life and had some very successful seasons there. But he basically had to compose music to order, as did all the composers within this system, symphonies, concertos. So you'll find that concertos and works for specific instrument would have been composed for musicians that they knew, musicians they personally knew, and uh, works to order. So this prince, Nicholas, would have specifically ordered uh, Haydn to compose works for him that included the instruments he liked, the instruments he could play, and along with other works, operas to entertain fancy guests from elsewhere in Europe, dignitaries, ambassadors, and um, background music. This is, of course, before an age of electricity, before CDs and radios and hi-fis playing in the background. So you had to pay musicians to be there to entertain your guests or to just play background music while you were having dinner. And then maybe the guests would bring a violin and join in too if they were musical and reasonably competent. And the next instrument is the glass harmonica and involves Mozart here. So during the last year of his life, which was 1791, Mozart wrote pieces for this weird instrument. He had first become acquainted with it as a child prodigy while touring around Europe with his family. His father ambitiously arranged many concerts in several aristocratic and royal courts to show off his talented children. Uh, Wolfgang's older sister, Anna Maria, was also exceptionally gifted, but ended up marrying a much older man, raising his three children. He was a widower and also two of her own. So unfortunately, her talent, which was, I believe from my reading, almost as good as her younger brothers, never really saw the light of day. She did compose, she did write down her compositions, but those manuscripts have become lost in the mists of time. Mozart reacquainted himself with the glass harmonica when he met Marianne Kirschgesner. She was a celebrated German glass harmonica player. Blinded by smallpox from the age of four, she showed a remarkable talent for this instrument, and she undertook numerous concert tours throughout Europe and met many significant composers, including Mozart. Unfortunately, I can't find a picture of her, but he wrote a quintet for her, along with a flute, oboe, viola, and cello, and also the adagio for glass solo harmonica. This glass harmonica started out as a set of upright glasses or goblets filled to different levels, uh, with water producing different pitches. And I don't know if any of you created kitchen orchestras when you were children at home using the lids of pots and pans for symbols and putting um, a, a, a tissue over a comb and making sounds with that, filling glasses of water to different levels. I often made kitchen orchestras with my mother's um, bits and pieces out of the bottom cupboard that I could reach and made music with that before I started the piano. So Benjamin Franklin uh, called this instrument a glass harp. He invented a similar thing. 
and radically modified the design by turning the vessels on their side and revolving them with a wheel, as you can see in the picture. The operator could rest his or her fingers on the bowls without the circular rubbing that you have to do on the glasses. At the height of its popularity, there were some who believed that this instrument um, could be detrimental to one's health. Such was the penetratingly eerie, weird sound emanating from the glasses. The German musicologist Friedrich Rotzlitz warned, if you are suffering from any kind of mental disorder, you should not play the glass harmonica. If you are not yet ill, you should not play it. If you are feeling melancholy, you should not play it. <laughs> so when Donizetti was looking for an instrument to aptly color his mad scene in his opera Lucia di Lammermoor, the glass harmonica was the obvious choice, referencing its association with mental illness. But I have seen summer musicians busking in the main street of Stockholm with water-filled glasses making melodies. So that you can see there with this slide, with this chap playing, and there's an accordion player in the background. And I see that from time to time and year, year after year in Stockholm. So let's listen to Mozart's Adagio for glass harmonica. Just a little bit for you to listen to there. The, our next instrument is the arpeggione, which looks similar to a bass viol, is bowed like a cello, has six strings. The, the cello and violin family have four strings, and it's tuned like a guitar, as you can see from the pegs. The only piece I know of specifically for the arpeggione is by Franz Schubert, one of the German composers from the Romantic era. And delightfully lyrical and full of pathos, it remains a popular concert instrument for cellists and violists. Naturally, its fortunes have revived in the recent upsurge in original instrument playing. And there are recordings of this lovely work available on the arpeggioni itself. Thank you. 
and I've stopped it there. You may have noticed that the sound of the piano wasn't quite right. And that's because unlike the modern piano forte, piano forte that we know today, the forte piano was one of the older models, a predecessor of the piano. So it has a slightly tinny sound quality or timbre. Um, compared to the lovely resonant Steinways and Bechsteins and what have you that we have today. Our next instrument is the cembalom, and after that I've got three more to play for you, just so you know where we're at. This instrument that you see here is a type of chordophone. A chordophone is the, the category of instruments with strings. And it's made up of a large trapezoidal box with metal strings stretched across the top. The instrument is commonly found in Central Eastern European countries, especially Hungary, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic, Serbia, Croatia, in what was uh, previously Yugoslavia, Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and in the traditional instrumental music of the Eastern European Jewish community or Kletzma music. It's also popular in Greece and in Romani or uh, Gypsy music. This instrument is typically played by striking the strings with two beaters, as you can see that man doing in the picture. And the composer who used it in his music quite a lot was the Hungarian nationalist composer Zoltan, Zoltan Kodai. So listen to the sound of the chimbalom in his Hari Janos suite. <laughs> Very characteristic and delightful folk music elements there. And a quick word on why I called Zoltan Kodai a Hungarian nationalist composer. In the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, after Napoleon's defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, the countries that had previously been dominated by the main musical players in the previous uh, romant well, during the Romantic era of the 19th century, the classical period, the Baroque period, those main players were Germany, France, and Italy, the leaders in the styles and forms of our Western art music in Europe. Um, peripheral countries began to express their own patriotism through their own native arts and folk material, folk songs and melodies, folk instruments, um, folk stories, tales and legends. So we had, for example, 
Greek in Norway, Smetana and Dvorak in the Czech Republic, or what was then Bohemia, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, um, Sibelius in Finland, Elgar in England, and a whole host of Russian composers, Balakirev, Borodin, Mussorgsky, Yugonsky, Korsakov, uh, using local material to express nationalism. And this became a part of uh, the, the many faceted um, picture of 19th century romanticism. Next, we have a really bizarre instrument, the musical saw. I first came across this instrument when I heard a recording of Cacciaturian's piano concerto on the radio and was immediately captivated by its otherworldly sound. I couldn't work out what it was and Googled it and was amazed when the announcer mentioned its inclusion in the piece. It's astonishing that an actual saw, I mean, saws used for cutting wood, can appear in the orchestra. A violin or cello player can prime his or her bow with rosin and draws it across the teeth of the saw. I would have thought that would break the horse hairs of which um, the, the uh, hairs from the tail of a horse are used in the, the, bow, the bow of stringed instrument. Anyway, I discovered that there are players in Russia and rural America who use hardware store saws, but many professionals buy custom-made saws, which are easy to flex and include a handle at the inner end to help in the bending process. So bending the saw into a flattish sort of S shape causes the blade not to vibrate at the points which are curved, so dampening any unwanted sounds. When the player varies the placing of the bow along the saw, they can alter the pitch. The wider end produces deeper notes, climbing up the scale towards the tip, ranging about two octaves or so. So that's 16 notes. To produce a vibrato sound, the player can either shake their knee or tremble their hand. Although it's used mainly in folk music, Kachaturian, who was Armenian, isn't the only classical composer who wrote music with this saw. Shostakovich used it in his operas, Lady Macbeth of the Matinsk district and The Nose. So listen out for the, the rich mellow sound of the bass clarinet at the beginning of this movement of his piano concerto, the middle slow movement and see if you can hear the saw. I, I couldn't hear it so well in this rendition. You hear the bass clarinet there? It's the flute playing with the piano. And very faintly, the musical saw in the background. You may have to turn up your audio.
also on. Let's get on with the next instrument. So that is the Ond Martineau. The modern French composer, Olivier Messiaen, liked to use an electronic musical instrument called the Ond Martineau. It was invented by Maurice Martineau in 1928 and derived its name, of course, from the French word onde, meaning waves. Its sound is produced by oscillating vacuum tubes. The first version required the player to wear a metal ring on his or her finger and pass it up and down a wire to create the sounds. Martineau wasn't satisfied with his initial experiments and eventually settled on three speakers, one with a gong installed inside and another containing 12 strings, which can be tuned. The range covers four octaves and a control box full of switches alters the timbres or sound qualities. So this next piece is by Messignon called Fête des Belles Eaux. And it requires six on Martineau. Well, you can hear perhaps that Olivier Messignon, um, what we would call a contemporary composer, um, he was a fantastic organist. And I often find that in his music, he brings the sounds and qualities and sort of um, experience of the organ into his music. Last but not least, I have a lovely piece that I found for you by the English composer Peter Maxwell Davies, An Orkney Wedding with Sunrise, and it's a wonderful, jaunty, Scottish-flavoured composition. It's one of the few pieces in the classical repertoire to feature a bagpipe solo, and this is especially for Victoria one of our members here in Cape Town, but who is Scottish. I'm right, aren't I? I hope you are Scottish. Yes, yes, it's absolutely, I am. Yes. Fantastic, Victoria. 
Anyway, this is one of Davy's lighter pieces and vividly depicts the riotous celebrations after a wedding in Orkney. The piece closes with the entry of the bagpipes, which Davies describes as symbolic of the rising sun over Caithness. In concert performance, the piper, dressed in traditional Scottish regalia, is required to enter the hall from the back, parading down the central aisle towards the stage and taking the soloist's position only as the piece concludes. It was actually commissioned by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, who premiered it, conducted by John Williams of Star Wars fame, um, in May 1985, and it's since been performed and recorded many times and has established, been established as one of Davies' most popular pieces. Now, it's quite a long piece. It's 11 minutes, so I'm going to play you bits of it from the, the, the opening, then a lovely jaunty middle section, and then go to the bagpipes bits at the end. That instrument is the oboe, ladies. And now the clarinet takes up the melody. And the flute. Oboe again. This is where you start dancing, Victoria. I'm going to skip to the next jaunty part. Those are muted trombones. Trumpets. Drums. Bulls. Now that sound, which is like horses' hooves clip clopping along, are the wooden blocks. It's a horn going ba, 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 ba. sort of hunting horn idea. Victoria, hop on your desk and do the Highland Fling for us.
And let's get to just about where the bagpipes come in. This piece is actually 13 minutes. It's a bit long. But um, this is about where we get the bagpipes. And the sunrise... So who says men don't look sexy in skirts? I do so enjoy that uniform, that outfit that the gentleman with the bagpipes is wearing. But I also agree with a comment that somebody made, um, apropos the queen uh, enjoying when she's at Balmoral to be awakened by the sounds of bagpipes outside her window. I do uh, think I prefer uh, whoever commented that bagpipes are best heard from afar, <laughs> not at close quarters. So that's it, ladies. And what you see there is the Swedish Nikkelharpe, which is a little bit like, um, oh, what is that thing called? I've forgotten. A, a bit like the baritón, a similar action to the baritón and to the lira organizzata, where you can see there are strings that are bowed, but there are also sympathetic wire strings that resonate at the same time, giving it its unusual timbre. And there are sort of hurdy-gurdy type buttons there, also um, contributing to the overall sound of the thing. And these are traditionally played um, on the, the two main summer festivals, Swedish National Day, which is the 6th of June, and also at Midsommar, which is the Midsummer Festival, originally a pagan celebration, but um, still carried on in the Northern Hemisphere and usually celebrated around the summer solstice on the Friday night and Saturday, uh, closest to the 21st of June. So I've got a Swedish diary here. It will be probably around when's Midsommar uh, day in Sweden. Why isn't it in my diary? Oh, here we go. It's going to be the Midsommar Afton. Is the 25th of June this year, ladies in Stockholm, and Midsommar Dagen is the 26th, Saturday the 26th. But it is on Friday the 25th, ladies, that you can perhaps join me in participating in a wonderful Swedish tradition, which is if you are an unmarried woman, you collect seven Swedish wildflowers, little, little tiny flowers from the fields and sidewalks around you, and you pop them under your pillow, and then you will dream about who you will marry. And if you are already married, like me, you do the same thing, and you pop the little bouquet of seven Swedish wildflowers under your pillow, and you make a wish. 
and then your wish will come true. And I promise you that every year for 10 years that I've been doing this, my wishes have come true. So it really does work. Ladies, there you will see my email address. For those of you who don't already have it, it is in the directories in the Stockholm and Cape Town uh, International Women's Clubs. And But any ladies watching in Italy or Joburg or elsewhere in the world, if you don't have my address and you'd like to ask a question or some information, there you can see music of note at morwadi.co.za. Morwadi is an African word meaning a runner, somebody that runs with a message in his hand or in his brain that he then verbalizes when he gets there. Before I let you all unmute and ask questions, I'd like to draw your attention to next month's meeting. Um, always the third Monday morning of the month. It may have to be afternoons in Sweden, as I said, because it gets dark um, and we have to juggle things. So it's going to be on the 17th of May. I'll be um, streaming from Cape Town, so 10.30 in the morning. And my theme is going to be Scandinavian composers from the 19th century Romantic era so Grieg, Sibelius, and a whole lot of composers, Stirnhammer, you may not have heard of. There are a lot of Swedish composers I hadn't heard of until I got to Sweden 11 years ago. And I'm including slides of the fantastic gardens and landscapes that I have seen in Norway, Finland, Denmark, and Sweden over the last nearly 11 years, because I've been, I've been here for a few months. Wonderful palaces and chateaus and gazebos and Norwegian fjords and sculptures and fabulous, fabulous things. So please do join me again on the uh, 17th of May. Then the next one in June, I still have to think of my theme and I will hopefully be back in Stockholm and um, join you from there. But with this modern technology, I can join you from anywhere. Hoping to be near Milan later this year, which is one of the reasons I reached out to the Benvenuto Club. But ladies, um, let's go back to where my email address is. And welcome to unmute yourselves if you have any questions about the music and composers and what have you this morning. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. Elizabeth, when you were talking about the saw, playing the saw, yes. isn't, isn't it the back of the saw, like the straight side of the saw rather than two side of the saw? My grandfather used to play when, with us when we were little kids and he used to oh. sort of bend, put the, like, sort of bend it. So it was warped like that. And then he used to run a, a, a bow over, over the... The back side, not the tooth side. Not the, so that's, oh, when I looked it up, it said the tooth side, and I worried about that because I thought that's going to break the horse hairs that yeah. comprise the um, uh, yeah, it would it would the, the, it was the composition sore of the bow. Of the, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I think I think so, maybe that was uh, that was not not correct because <laughs> because it gives the it gives quite a, a lovely sound. You know the. And and where you where you put your bow up and down the the, the bend it depends on the sound you get or how how much pressure you put on the the, oh, bend, the saw to get the different curve. I haven't curvatures. seen one. I haven't seen one played live. Mm -hmm. I have to say, mm -hmm. I've just spotted a message from Elena Mattioli in Milan, who says there's also a very interesting museum there at the Castello. Um, would that be the, the castle that was inhabited by the Sforzas who used to rule yes. Milan? Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. that's it. That's oh, it. great, yes. Elena. Oh, that's The looks one in great. Milano. Then there is one in uh, Cremona, which is really outstanding. Uh, the, the, oh, the, Cremona for the Stradivarius family. Yes, yes. There you have many, many, and also all the explanations on anything you may want to know about violence. Oh, wonderful. I must definitely go there. It's not too far from Milan. Can I take a train from Milan to Cremona? Yes. 
Yes, yes. Great. Can, I'm yes. going to do that in the autumn. Oh, We're planning yes. to try and go and stay in Italy for a few months to, to see what it's like. And yes. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at some questions. Um, any other questions, ladies? I would like to speak, but I can see my... No, Sorry, I'm Maria? Not but I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. No, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I'm in Mil from Milano. I'm speaking from, but I'm Hungarian. And thank oh. you. You mentioned more, many Hungarians in this uh, speech. I did. And yes. Bartok and Kodai. Bartok, mm. Kodai, uh, this Esther Hadi Prince. And, but the yes. only that I would like to say that the cymbal is very, very used also now, but the, for, with the gypsy, gypsy orchestra. Yes. Yes. And this, I can advise every, uh, advice to everybody that you can also look at in YouTube for a gypsy orchestra because they are very, very virtuous for the cymbal Yes. Cymbal because in this uh, piece of uh, Kodai, Cannot cannot hear really the symbol because it's very very strange, very nice instrument that Hungarian are very very virtuous. The Hungarian gypsy band. Yes, they, we were in Hungary in two thousand and one, and they took us to hear proper gypsy bands. And um, with uh, there was a little boy playing a child size violin, and the father was playing the cimbalom. It's also in Romanian music, the Romanian Rhapsodies um, by the Romanian composer George. Um, oh, it's gone out of my head. I'll think of it. But um, let me see the new message. Okay, Marilda. Oh, I wanted to ask Michelle. Michelle Day, I saw you joined us. Are you in Pezinas in south of France or in Stockholm? If she's still there, maybe she's left. I think she's left. Okay, ladies, any other um, questions or comments? I think that's it, Amanda. So I can stop share. Thank you. And very it's a great pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you next month, ladies who can join me. Um, I'll send the link to Sule again and she can share it with the club in Milan and Johannesburg guests. And um, what I also wanted to ask the Cape Town ladies is if any of you are interested in or brave enough to attempt um, a hybrid meeting in May, I'm hoping more and more of us will have the vaccines. Those of us over 60 can have registered or can register to get the vaccine. When we'll actually get them, I don't know. But I heard on the radio this morning that two lots of 30 million vaccines, one from um, Pfizer and one from um, AZ, AstraZeneca, are um, on order for South Africa. Um, most of our care workers, the doctors and nurses, have been vaccinated. But um, if any ladies would like to think about coming to my flat again for the May meeting, um, we will have masks. I'll ask you to dress warmly because it's nearly winter here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I will have the doors and windows open probably. Um, eating and drinking can only be outside in the fresh air where you may remove masks and I'll have sanitizer. So there'll be all sorts of strictures and structures in place to keep us all healthy. I've had COVID and I don't want to get it again. And I know two people who've had it for the third time. So I'd like to warmly welcome those who would like to drop me a line if you're willing to come and sit here with your own devices, socially distanced, um, while I sit here at the dining table with my piano behind me. And um, I will do a Zoom, definitely. I'll carry, um, in fact, I think we should carry on doing hybrids going forward because then ladies in other countries can join us. Even when I have 20 ladies back in my apartment here, as was the case the year before last. 
So drop me a line, Cape Town ladies, if you'd like to join me next month. And then Amanda and I will assess uh, whether it's a good idea and whether it's feasible. Otherwise, um, I say ciao a tutti and I'll see you all hopefully next month.